morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad to see a lot of smiling faces. Hi, I'm Rowan. It's nice to, I've met a couple of you and you're all lovely. I've been, had such a warm welcome. I come from down south, about six hours from Kurubong, and yesterday I drove up, good travels, not really much traffic on the highways, which is great. But yeah, I'm glad to be here. I was invited by April to come preach at the beginning of this year, in fact, and I was tossing up whether I should do it or not, because I've like, this whole year has been like, I didn't know what was happening, but I took the last slot in the schedule and I grabbed it and I was like, all right, I'll preach here at this date, today, and here I am. <laughs> so that's, that story, that children's story was perfectly matches with my topic of my sermon, which is great. Um, and another thing about that pottery art style, the gold within the cracks becomes the strongest point of the pot. Once they, what once was the weakness becomes the strongest of the pot. And so today I'm just going to be talking to you guys about how God can use our brokenness to shine his glory unto others. And so the title for my sermon today is called Broken with a Purpose. And I'm going to start off by asking you guys a question. Who here has ever in their life, throughout their, all their life, had a point where they were just at the lowest they've ever been? Or has been to a point where they've made mistakes and completely regret it? I'm sure that can relate to a lot of people here. I'm going to tell you a story about a guy. A man. His name is, that's not his name, it's actually Josh. Um, and that's actually not Josh. I just found that photo. Um, so Josh, pretty much, he, let me tell you about his journey. He grew up in a church, not the SDA church, but in a Baptist church. But as he was growing up, his Christian life wasn't quite good. It was sort of lukewarm balancing on the cold side. But his dad always made a point to teach him the Bible, to pray with him. As he was growing up, he lived in a not-so-good neighborhood down in Sydney, and his church experience was his parents forcing him to go to church and, like, making him, which a lot of young people nowadays can relate to. And the second thing was that his friends were there. Growing up, there was... As around 11, 12, there was these big kids that he kind of looked up to. They were in a gang. The way they dressed, the, the music they liked, he, he looked up to them in all sorts of ways. He looked up to the way that they had pretty girls around them all the time. He liked the type of music they were listening to. And so he looked up to that. And that sort of became his, grew into his lifestyle. He joined in with them. They involved him. Sadly, he got involved with drugs at a young age and alcohol as well, which is very sad, which also helped, affected his life going on. Um, but he just looked up to this sort of lifestyle. And so at school, his, in year six, he would make a little g- gang with people of like-minded people, and like they'll do graffiti at school, this sort of thing, that sort of thing. And... Yeah, it wasn't really a good school life. Um, he also continued this further into high school as well with other like-minded people. But he, found, he met this girl. He really liked this girl. Um, and something his dad always taught him was, if you ever go to date someone, make sure it's a Christian. It will save you a lot of hassle further down in life. And so he met this girl. He was Baptist, or he left the church. He said to his dad, I don't want anything to do with church anymore. Dad didn't force him. Later, he found this girl, said, oh, you're a Christian, right? He's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, okay, good. That's all I need to know. Um, Later, he found out that his girlfriend didn't eat pork. And he he thought that was strange. He's like, all Christians eat pork. And she's like, no, 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 we don't. We're we're Seventh-day Adventists. We don't eat pork. And (laughs) so he was very curious, why? Why is this? So he goes, asks his pastor, like, 
What's the Seventh-day Adventist? And the pastor's like, oh, let me tell you about them, Seventh-day Adventists. They're a cult, blah, blah, blah. And just saying all this stuff. And that night, he, he, Joshua was on his, the phone to his girlfriend, like, oh, you've got to leave. They, they're a cult. They, they don't eat pork, blah, blah, blah. And like, you've got to leave that church. She invites him to church. He was very curious at what these Seventh-day Adventists were like. Goes there and finds out, oh, they, they look pretty normal. <laughs> They're not wearing any funny outfits or anything. If anything, they're kind of like me. Because he went to the, the same age Sabbath school and found out that the, people, the young people there were sort of like him. They also liked um, rap music and sort of similar heritage backgrounds, Spanish, that sort of stuff. And later he found out that he, well, he was really into rap music and he sort of started getting into Christian rap, like, with these people from the church as well. He made a really close friendship with these guys, and they got into rap. They were getting very high in the record. They were very good at it. And one thing led to another. They still got into drugs, alcohol, as the influence got bigger. It wasn't that good of Christian sort of rap at all. He still wasn't having a connection with God at this point. As he was going on, um, he, was get, he got really into this gang sort of mentality. And one thing led to another. He somehow got very, very into conspiracy theories. And, yeah, it's, he, just, he was known in the gang as the guy who knew everything about conspiracies. If you wanted to talk about this sort of stuff, you go to him. And so a friend of his found a flyer just on the side of the street. It was a pamphlet. And it was about these talks. It was at a church. It was about end time stuff, aliens, Illuminati, that sort of stuff. And his friend wanted him to go, or he wanted to go. And so his friend wanted to drag him along with him. He was hesitant. It's like, no, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Because at this point in life, all this conspiracy stuff, knowing about what's happening around the world, was very degrading on him. It, it, it was not, he was not in the right place in life. And his friend just kept pestering and pestering. He was like, no, no, I'm not going, I'm not going. Eventually he was like, all right, to get you off my back, I'll go once. Because there was a series of talks, and he's like, I'm only going to one. He goes with his friend, and he's just listening. He gets hooked. He's like... This guy knows what he's talking about. I've got to talk to this guy. He knows exactly what he's got wisdom, he's got experience, he knows what he's talking about. So after he goes up to the pastor and says, Oh, you're Christian, right? He's like, Yeah. I'm Seventh day Adventist. Like, oh, you're one of those people. He's like, Why? What's wrong? Oh, I've heard you guys don't eat bacon. He's like, <laughs> and the pastor's like, Oh, well, how about after I come around to your, I'm around for quite a while doing these talks, I'll come around to your place and do Bible studies with you. He's like, oh, no, nah, I'm good, I'm good. They kept talking for a couple more hours. The pastor brings the topic back up about doing Bible studies. He's like, all right, all right, you can come over and we'll do Bible studies. This pastor was very patient with this man because Josh, what his plans was, was when he ca- the pastor would come, he'd keep a ki- he would say different things about the church, like, oh, the church is wrong, try and convince him that he's in the wrong church because he still believed that the Baptist church was his, the right church. And... So he would keep coming and keep coming and try and pester. So many arguments coming out against the church. And then, but the pastor always kept coming up with good answers, good answers. Eventually, it came to the point where Josh was like, all right, he keeps answering these questions. I know something I can get him with. They have a false prophet. I'll find any information I can have about Ellen White and accuse her of being wrong. He goes on the internet, starts searching, finds out that all the information is either she didn't say it or it was misinterpreted. And then later gets convicted saying that I'm no longer fighting the church, I'm fighting the Bible. And that convicts him to sort of change. He needs, he say, I need a change. I need to stop this lifestyle. I can't fight the Bible. And he gets, he leaves the gang. 
His gang wasn't happy about it. He's like, oh, yeah, you're a coward. It's like, oh, you're not, you're not a real one. And he was so confused because these were like his brothers, someone he would take a bullet for. But they're t- sort of turning their back on him now that he's wanting to quit, do something better with his life. He moves on and he goes to church. He's starting to learn about the Bible, all this sort of stuff, getting into Bible studies. And he was just on fire. He was like, God can do anything. He's, he's here, he's doing, he's moving, he's amazing. He gets a call. His cousin got into an accident, into a fight when they got drunk at a bar. And he's on life support. He hangs up the phone, rushes to the hospital, the whole family around the bed. He didn't know what to do. He starts praying. His dad joins in. His whole family's like different religions, Catholic, Baptist, starts praying, starts, his dad starts to join in the prayers. Later he gets, all the family starts to slowly join. And then he's like, I know what I have to do. I have to get the pastor and the elder over and pray over my cousin. The whole family knew that the elder and the pastor were SDS. And he's like, all right, if they're preaching, God's definitely going to move. And once... And at any moment now, he, we're going to get a call and saying, my cousin's opened his eyes and he's going to be all right. And then everyone know that God's with the church, with the Seventh-day Adventists. He kind of got a, a different call. A call saying that there was nothing we could do when he turned the machine off. And his cousin passed away. He was furious with God. He... Blame God for everything, and in his anger, made foolish mistakes. After the funeral service, his family came up to him and said, "We're going to the RSL. We're gonna." Uh, and his mate was next to him and asked him, "Oh, do you want to go?" He looked at this point. He's married. He has a kid. He looks over his wife. Wife, almost with tears in her eyes, says, "Don't go." Because the only thing people really do to go when they go to the RSL is to either go to the pokies and spend all your money, two, buy cheap alcohol, or, well, you could get a good meal as well if catering's good, but, um, but they knew that they were going to go there to drink. And he, out of anger, he says, let's go. He rocks up, gets handed a beer, can't. He doesn't quite know how many he had, but it was around 12 maybe. Later, he ends, later that night, he ends up at a drug dealer's place. He got back onto drugs and alcohol. And he was just not in control of anything. And he was just letting it go. And he got back into the whole rap industry. Because before when he came back to God, the one thing he didn't want to give up was music. He got into Christian rap, but because of this, he went back into his old lifestyle, and the Christian rap sort of lost its Christian style to it. Swear words kept coming in, got into drugs, alcohol, smoking weed, all this sort of stuff. <clears throat> he was just letting go, getting into the world, and he still had his family, his wife, his kids. His relationship was on the rocks, pretty much. Like, it was very rocky. So much so that it came to the point where his own mother said to his wife to leave him. And his mother loves him to death, loves him more than anything in the world. But it took a lot for her to say to his wife to leave him because he's just not in a good place. It got to the point where he was getting very popular in the rap industry. He was getting labels, contracts, all this sort of stuff. He was at one night drunk at a rap station, a uh, studio station, doing, uh, recording a song. His old gang comes back because they see that he didn't actually change. He's back into the lifestyle. They thought that the reason why he left was an excuse. And so they wanted revenge. They were angry at him. So they come banging on the door. He gets warned. He's inside. The doors are locked. Like, 
uh, like jail bars on the doors and everything just to keep everything safe. The producer says, who are good friends with the old gang and him, says, they're out to get you tonight. And he was, didn't know what to do. He didn't want to get his old friend, his new friends involved with this. So the new friend, two friends escape, was able to get out the front door where the old gang was. He goes to the back door. It is a metal, hard metal door, locked. He, he was, he didn't know what he was going to do. He was like, I'm going to die tonight. He didn't know what to do. And as most people do when they're desperate and don't know what to do, they call out to God. Even though all your adrenaline's rushing, you just call out, God help me. And as he pushed on the door, it locked, pushed again, it opened. That wasn't the only miracle that night. Got in the car, they raced off, going 150 down the road, running red lights. It was a miracle they didn't hit anyone. And later, they found that one of the big guys from the old gang was coming up to the window with a baseball bat. Went to swing, and all of a sudden, his, they didn't know what happened, but later they found out that his friend told him that, don't know what happened, but someone pushed the car forward. And the bat swung into the back window. Not the front window where it was aiming before. They keep racing. The, old, the cars from the old gang are chasing right behind them. But as they keep going, they keep looking back and noticing they're getting further and further and further away. God saved his life that night. And his new gang, they didn't know, they were furious at this. They were like, they, they were furious at the old gang for retaliating at um, the new uh, Josh. They were pl- setting up plans to go up, bash these guys, uh, these, the old gang. And, but Josh was like, no, 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 you can't do that, can't do that. And some guys were like, yeah, we can't do that because they will retaliate even harder. So they came up with a plan to kill them. So one of the, they were able to get about 30 people armed with guns. And they were calling up Josh every day trying to, he's like, you in? You in? We got this. Come on, we, should we go today. We go today. Josh wasn't responding to any messages. He was just at the lowest point of his life ever. His wife was staying with the, his, her mother, with the kid, and he just didn't know what to do. He was like, if I do this, I could end up dying. I could go to prison. I have a kid. Most of my friends have kids as well. They'll be in prison. He was just, he didn't know what to do. And he, it, multiple nights, he was just didn't know what to do. He was like, can't do this, can't do this. It's like, he was like contemplating suicide. A voice in his head was saying, if you, just, if you disappeared, all the problems will go away. This is all centered around you. If you go away, it will just disappear. All the problems will go on. So he was contemplating suicide. But then he looked over at his wife's bedside table, saw a Bible, and a Sabbath school quarterly. And it was sort of glowing. He saw it glowing. He was like, God calling out to him. He was like, but another voice came into his head. It's like, you can't go to God. Look at all all the stuff you've done. You've done drugs, alcohol. You're in a gang. You can't go to God now. It's too late. But he found out but that night, he saw the Sabbath school quarterly. He grabbed it, and literally the first page he opens up was a picture of the prodigal son who came back to his father and was get, getting hugged by his father. That moment changed his life. It was God telling him that nothing can stop you from coming back to me. And... That night, he went and told his mates, they were expecting him to come and say, yeah, yeah, let's go. But now he came and said, I found Jesus that night. He told them. Some laughed and some were just listening. And he said that night to them, this night, you will never see me touch alcohol or drugs again. And praise God that, that has never, he has never touched it since. Now, you're probably wondering, why am I telling you this story? But to sum up his journey so far, he got into gangs, he got into drugs, drinking, 
conspiracy theories, but then he found God, but then he lost his faith, but then he came back to God. Now, you're probably wondering, why am I telling you this story about someone else, not me, completely unrelated to me, don't even know this guy. This is a story about a man who's broken, who came to the breaking point, to almost taking his own life. This is a man who has a broken past. But his story doesn't end at that. He is now, I can gladly say, happily married with this, his wife and his kid. He's a pastor down at Sydney, preaching and winning souls for Christ. God is now using him. And he's using his testimony to reach other people. And you're probably one, like, and I have a text to sort of back up the change that he has gone through. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He is, that's the thing about Jesus. When he comes into your life, you don't stay the same. And it's like with the pottery. Broken pot, but they they take those broken shards and they put gold in it. They fill it and strengthen it. That's what God does with us. He comes in, takes our broken selves, and he recycles us. He doesn't throw us away. He recycles us. But how can we be used by God? My first tip is to pray for guidance. Prayer is a powerful tool that we've been given as followers of Christ. It is a tool that we can use to talk to our Heavenly Father. It is a tool that we can use to let God have influence over other people's lives. So I say, pray for guidance. And sorry for the spelling mistakes. I missed quite a few of them. <laughs> Second, I say, pray that God uses you in the best way possible. That is a dangerous prayer, keep you in mind. Because if you pray that prayer, he will use you. One way or another, he will use you. But the problem is, most people aren't willing to let God use them. They pray this prayer, but they... Don't let God allow them to change their lives. They're too comfortable in the way they are. So be willing for God to guide you and lead you into a new beginning. And tell your testimony. Like I just told a testimony of someone down in Sydney. Testimonies are a powerful tool that we have as individuals to breach others. Because our testimony may align with someone else's testimony. Everyone has a testimony. That's what's so good about it. You have a testimony, I have a testimony, everyone has a testimony. I love hearing testimonies about how God moves in someone's lives. And to show you just from Scripture just how powerful a testimony is, I want to bring you to Revelation 12, 10 to 11. I also have it on the screen. And it says, wait, is this, no, this, that's not the right verse. Then, here we go. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has, have come. For the accuser of our brethren, that being you, me, and all God's people, who accuse them before God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him, the accuser, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love themselves to death. So it's not just your testimony that's powerful, but it's through God's power that your testimony becomes powerful. That you became, can, through Christ, overcome others. Because... Nothing is impossible with God. He, he is a God that can relate to us. As he says in Hebrews, seeing that we have a high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who, we, who cannot symp symp sympathize with us, with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the grace, a throne of grace that, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. 
So in your times of need, in your brokenness, we can gladly come to Christ. He says it himself, come to him. We are broken people. We are not perfect. But in God's perfectness, he can reach us. So I say, come as you are. For God says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, God's yoke, and you will be, and uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. No matter what burdens we go through or struggles in our lives, whether it's our past that we still are trying to carry, we can all bring that and lay it at the feet of Jesus. And we will take on his yoke and our burden will be light. For he came to die for our sins, that we may not be burdened by our sins, but he took it for us. And to wrap up, I just want to give you guys an analogy. The broken pot with the gold, that's a beautiful analogy as well that I also wanted to use, but it was perfectly used in the story. Thank you. I didn't actually include it in mine. There was, there's a lot of pottery sort of analogies that you can use, but this one I really love. Wait, right, was this one. Be confident of this very thing. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. This text says that God is beginning work in all your lives. And he will complete it. So the broken pot, that's what I like to call it. You could give it other names, but I like to call it this. So you take two pots, one completely broken, got cracks in it, holes, you're missing chunks in it, that sort of thing. And then you've got a perfect, clean, clear pot. Now you put a candle in both these pots. I have a question for you all. Which pot are you gonna shine, is going to see the most light through it? The broken pot. Just like us, we are all broken people. But God uses our brokenness to reach other people who are broken. He uses broken people to reach broken people. He doesn't need to use us. He could make the rocks cry out. But he uses us for our benefit as well. There's nothing better than to be used by God for his glory. It brings such joy. And I've experienced this myself. So just like broken pots, I want to ask you all a question. Are you going to allow God to shine his glory through you and your brokenness? Are you going to let, just let him work through your life? For he says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. We have all fallen short, but God still uses us. So, as I wrap up, I want to just leave you with this one question. How are you going to let God use you and shine his love, his glory and light through your cracks? Sorry, I got caught up in the beautiful music. Thank you, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the love that you've given us. Thank you that in our weakness you are strong. And Lord, that no matter how bad our sins may be, you always say, come to you and you will give us peace. Lord, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And Lord, I pray, help us to all give our burdens unto you and just be used by you, Lord. I pray this for everyone here. In your name I pray, amen.